So hi, welcome everybody that is here. Thank you for taking the opportunity to come today, whether in person or online. Uh, because we do not have a quorum, we won't be voting on anything. But today is, again, more information. Uh, I guess there is an update to the design, and then Mike is going to give us more things to consider and think about when designing the actual mechanical parts of the pool, structural parts of the pool. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, I don't know who it was that was talking uh, about an update from the design. Great, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, wow. Jill DeCourcy from Jones Whitset. Um, I just, we, based on the feedback we got at the last pool building meeting, we made a few revisions and have um, two options. We wanted to just show quickly. So I will share that now. Right here, are you seeing the PDF? Yep. Okay, great. So um, what we were looking at uh, at the last meeting, we had talked about swapping out the toilets and the pool office space. And so we have two schemes looking at that and we just wanted to, to share those. Um, we have also um, tightened up the, the pool footprint a little bit based on the input we got. We have not made any changes yet to the pool mechanical space that we're going to do after we have all of the equipment selections made, but we do know that we're going to be able to save a few hundred square feet there based on the choice of filter, filtering system. Um, but in any case, here are two options. One with the pool office, we're looking in, at this option here, moving the pool office to the front side of the building. Uh, with the corridor separating from the toilets and pool storage moves here. This is one shuffling. Mm -hmm. So this corridor is no longer before it had been about here. So you had to walk pretty far along the, the deck to get to the bleachers. The uh, advantage of this one is that you have an outside wall into the office so you can get a little natural light in there. There is the possibility to have an interface uh, with the vestibule if that's desired, you can then have, you know, somebody monitoring who's coming in and having an interaction at this, this point. We still have uh, a lot of glazing, um, looking out to the pool and um, toilets kind of centrally located off this lobby. In this other configuration, this is trying to move that pathway to the, the bleachers as far to the side as possible. So in this case, the pool office is more centrally located, um, you still could have a kind of transaction window or small concessions window here facing the lobby, um, but it would not be at the vestibule. Um, you have uh, kind of a central view into the pool from the office. And in both of these, you know, we're showing uh, a little bit more, you know, a kitchenette area space for uh, meeting with a number of, of the staff and then the, the desk area. So wanted to present those, um, see if you have an initial reaction. If one of them is not working, then we'll just go with the other. Um, but that was the response based on last, last week. Does anybody have any questions or need clarification? Um, I don't know if you can go up to, it looks like you changed maybe some of the storage and mechanical stuff. I'm not totally sure because I think that looks different than a little bit than what it looked like before possibly or uh, not. The three rooms off of the pool are the same in terms of square footage okay. uh, the, as they were. The thing that looks a little bit different is I've just started populating uh, for instance, the table for the um, timers and like a location where the lifeguard chair might go, some additional items within that. But the uh, those three rooms are currently the same as they were the last time you saw it. We have been fleshing out the bleachers as well. So you have the two over here and um, it's a four row bleacher. Four rows over here. Yeah. So not hearing a strong uh, response in either case. I think the main question is just, um, is this gonna be, is it, how critical is it that we get this aligned with the, 
the bleacher area. Jill, I think that would be my thought uh, in, in agreement with that. The, the one on the left has that access further towards the public bleachers. So for traffic, um, I think that one would make more sense in terms of keeping the deck clean at, in the pool area. Also, I would think that that lines that office up more central to the pool, uh, which I think is more advantageous potentially. So that, that would be my thought. Okay. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. And I think that we had talked about having some um, potential interface between the office and the lobby, but it was not essential that it be at the vestibule. So that was, you know, just confirming with this group that that seems correct, that you would have something with the lobby, but it's okay that it's pulled back um, from that entrance way. Okay. I have a quick question from the, the design you gave us before to the design today. There's almost a difference in the pool area, about 1,000 square feet. Where did that go or what happened with that? The, the pool area going down. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've tightened up the pool to be, before it was just slightly larger than what was required. So we've gone down to the, the um, eight, eight foot lanes. It was a little bit wider before. Um, getting it down to exactly the 75 feet um, and then just tightening up a little bit of the space around. We're still allowing uh, more space to the um, plan north here than is at West Springfield, but getting our dimensions a little bit tighter to that, closer to that. Um, so for this one, you said it's 75 feet or 25 yards by what's the width of the pool? It's 48 feet. 48. Okay. Jill, did, did, Jill, did you happen to find out if there will be an uh, outside lane line in this design because of the stairs? And if so, are we accounting for that in the um, standard eight feet per lane? I just don't want that last lane to be small because there's an extra lane line in there. I do not know that. So I'm going to follow up on that. Okay. So Greg, I looked up, um, I actually had a text message to a friend that's of mine that's a USA official. And they say that for competition, it should be seven feet at minimum. And then for um, older kids like high school, it should be about eight. And it says sometimes pools will be built with a little bit of extra room on the side. But what you you don't technically have to have a lane line on the outside, like the outside lanes. But what you can do is you can get like a smaller lane line or something to block off the stair section right there if you need to. Or you can put one in for the whole length, but it doesn't have to be eight feet. It should be seven for competition. So the fact that we have it at 48, you feel is is sufficient. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I can wait and see if we need it to be a little bit bigger. I haven't heard back from <laughs> my friend yet, but, um, it definitely says in the USA rule book, it has to be seven, but usually if you're going to have older kids, you would want it to be eight, which we do have. I know for high school school meets now, we do not put outside lane lines in our pool. Right. But we don't have those stairs. And right. um, if we're going to do it anyway, I think it's, uh, we do it on both sides and it makes you know, an outside lane, an inside lane, which there are some advantages to that as well. So but I would case, like uniform lane size, I guess in the end is what I'm looking for, yeah. So it sounds like we, we might want to in, give an extra foot at least. Um, so you have the option of doing the outside lane lines in the width. Yeah, well, I would imagine it's a standardized system right so okay. if we're going to use the outside lane lines then yes the extra space if we're not then no the extra space okay then the okay. other one, then the outside ones would be bigger if we don't um and then why did we shrink the the pool area size for cost are we trying to keep cost we're just trying to get it to be the minimum area possible so trying to okay. keep it efficient while not you know recognizing it that, you know, looking at West Springfield as the example, the places where it felt tight, making sure that we're not repeating that. One okay. of the big places that we took some of that square footage out of was actually the um, bleacher area. 
as we'd had it previous times, we hadn't actually laid the bleachers out yet. And we were in between what works for four rows of bleachers and what works for five rows of bleachers in terms of the square footage we were showing. So we made four, we put in four rows of bleachers and brought the wall in slightly to match to that. And four um, rows of bleachers is the same as West Springfield, correct? I think it's actually more than West Springfield, if I recall. I thought West Springfield had three, but I wasn't there in person. But I also, I don't want us to, um, this thing about the dimensions, I do think we should continue to explore, but also I know we have Mike on today and he has a lot of information available to go through. I don't want to uh, hold too much time on this sure. piece, uh, for this piece of the process. Okay, well, we're going to keep refining this, but we will probably continue then with this option off to the, to the left, which seems to be... Um, meeting the needs a little bit better. So that gives us the direction we need. And I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Mike. Um, I feel like just, and and Mike, let me know what you think. It seems like you have a couple different topics to go over and does it make sense to just do your slides on each topic and then stop for questions at that point? I don't know if he's here. I don't see him on there. I, I have one quick question about, can you tell us, tell me what is the amount of space you have on the end of the shadow on the deep end? No, he's here. <clears throat> um, Aviva, I'm gonna let you handle that. <laughs> can, you say that can you say that again? I'm just wondering how much space right now is allocated at the end of each side of the pool, the shallow end of the deep end between that edge of the pool and the exterior wall you mean yes of the space um give me one moment i can pull that up so um from the wall of the pool we're putting about a two foot buffer for the drain um and then on the shallow end, we have another eight feet. And on the deep end, we have uh, about 12 feet, just under 12 feet. Just under 12 feet. Yep. And that, so that's, and then there's the two feet of, of drain and then the wall of the pool. Okay. Which is a great segue into the next, to the presentation, which is starting with drains. <laughs> is that me? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> Sorry. I, um, I overheard you guys talking about lane lines, just just to make a brief comment. Um, when it comes to the lane widths, uh, it's really more about swim practice than it is swim meets, just because during swim practice, there's six to eight kids in one lane circle swimming and they're doing short strokes like breaststroke and butterfly where they're kind of have these like big five foot wingspans. So um, just like how cars drive on roads and there's a yellow line in the middle where there's cars coming this way and then cars coming this way, it's the same thing during swim practice. You're sharing one lane with all those people. So the wider the lane, it just makes for more productive practices. Coaches like little wider lanes because then kids can do strokes like breaststroke and butterfly and not be bumping into each other as they're swimming in, in opposite directions towards one another. Uh, during a swim meet, besides the warm up, which of course is very crowded because all the teams are in the pool at the same exact time, but during a swim race, there's one kid in one lane and they swim down the middle. So it's it's not really about racing when it comes to the lane line with. It's about managing multiple teams and multiple kids in the pool at one time when they're circle swimming. Another thing is too, it sounds like we're putting a diving board in between lanes three and four, like right in the middle. And when you do that, we want some wider lanes also because. It's, it just helps manage that space in between because you're going to have lane three, which is a starting block, and lane four, which is a starting block, and then a diving board right in the middle. So the wider we can get the lanes, the more comfortable everyone's going to be uh, on the deep end of the pool when they're lined up behind the blocks and you know managing swim meet warm-ups and that sort of thing. So that was just my two cents on the lane stuff. But we kind of talked about making the pool a little wider anyway. A normal, a normal six-lane, 25-yard pool without diving and without extensive programs, like usually like a YMCA six lane 25 yard pool, it's 45 feet wide. 
Um, but with a pool like this, knowing that we're going to have meets, clubs, warm ups, and diving in the middle, we're going to try and we're going to want to stretch that 45 out a little bit and get you some wider lanes. But um, certainly, seven that seven to eight foot width lane is is what USA Swimming clubs and programs are are hoping to see when they go to pools. And as far as those lane lines on the outside. It's not really common in New England. You don't see a lot of that in the Northeast, but you know, out in California and some places like Texas, where you know they take their swimming hardcore real serious, and it's more of a popular sport than football is. You know, out in California, there's a varsity swim team just about everywhere. Um, they like to put those lane lines against the outsides because they think it makes a huge difference. Kind of doesn't. And the thing is, if we have a really nice deck level sort of gutter system that's collecting the water. Um, quelling the waves, it's 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 really unnecessary. So, um, just my two cents on the lane line piece there. Great, thank you. Yep. Now, did you want me to share my screen or? Yeah. Yeah. Them? Why don't you go ahead and share your screen? Okay. Um, um, I'm going to start it from the beginning, but flip through the slides quick because I know I already did some of these slides, right? I think we had gotten through the filtration system and had come to a decisions i feel like you could probably just start after that point okay can you all see my screen oh, yeah. not, not yet mm -hmm. okay let me okay. um am i authorized as a presenter here you yeah. should be so yeah okay um let's see all right how about now yep <laughs> perfect okay um this thing out of the way Okay, so um, let's see, we'll flip through. So we already talked about filters. We've already decided that regen is a good choice. Um, and I totally agree with you for this scenario. You, really, when it just comes to regen now, we just have to kind of get you guys to make a decision on which company you want to supply it. You've got a few choices. I think for the purpose of this meeting, I'll just give you the names of those companies. You could jot them down and perhaps just reach out to the salespeople yourself. Go, I could set up lunch and learns with them. Um, not all regen filters are created equal and there's not many. So you have about three solid companies to choose from when it comes to regen filters. Um, I will say that um, Aquify, which is the uh, brand that you see here on the screen is the latest and greatest in the regen filter technology. Um, they hit the marketplace about two years ago and they sort of are made up of many employees from other regen filter companies of the past and sort of decided to start their own company and improve on older technology that hasn't really done much in 10 years. Um, so that's Aquify. Uh, they, they manufacture their filters in Dallas, Texas. They've got already a, a bunch of installs at major universities and major water parks. And a lot of the big architects and contractors are switching to this company because they've innovated. Um, for example, uh, this particular brand um, does not have a, a big head on top of it that needs to be lifted up. Um, so we can sort of have a smaller ceiling height if we need to in the pump room, whereas sort of Neptune Benson and the other filter manufacturers have, you need to have, they're, they're much taller. And then they also have like a 20 inch ceiling head requirement. So you can get up and into that monstrous lid that it has. Um, with this company, you can see they just have these giant manways along the side here and you could crawl into them like a sand filter. It makes the maintenance a lot easier. Plus, they offer a fiberglass option as well as a stainless steel option, whereas the other companies do not. So um, let's see. OK, so this is a Neptune Benson Defender. So that's the other company. They're called Neptune Benson. And that's this uh, blue one here. They were the original regen filter on the marketplace. Um, they've got probably the most regen installations nationwide um, because they've been around longer. They just haven't really done much to innovate their technologies and systems over the past few years. Um, so they're kind of just kind of going off of what they've always done. Um, and those are big, giant, heavy stainless steel, uh, carbon steel systems. And you can see up top, there's this big lid, it looks like a soda can with a top on it. That has to actually come up like 20 inches and swing to the side if you need to get inside the tank for maintenance. And people find that very inconvenient. Um, so, and plus, like I said, they're carbon steel, so they're just really, really heavy. And come time for installation, they're sort of tricky to get into a space. Um, but they both do the same thing. And then the third company is called Paddock, um, P-A-D-D-O-C-K. 
So you've got Aquify, uh, Neptune Benson, and Paddock. And again, Paddock is another big carbon steel filter. They've been doing it for 10 years or so. They were the second one on the market. Um, and again, really haven't done much to change themselves over the years. I would say Aquify is the um, latest and greatest when it comes to the technology and user interface. So, but but I'll leave that up to you guys. You can go on their websites and check and they have salespeople. So the salespeople love to go and sell their stuff. So you can contact them and they'll send you cut sheets and brochures. If you want me to introduce you formally to some of these sales reps, I can, and they can do a similar meeting on why their region's better than the others. But any of those three will do, uh, uh, will do the trick. Um, and uh, let's see, so we've already decided that. And again, fiber, you, if you if you want a fiberglass filter, the only chance you have is is with Aquify because the other companies don't do it, um, and it's just smaller. It fits in the room better. It's it's Regen filters aren't pressure tanks anyway. They don't require a lot of pressure like a sand filter. So they decided why do we need carbon steel when we could pull it off with fiberglass, and it just makes it a lot easier for the contractor. Um, okay, so that wraps up the regen. Now, when it comes to your uh, perimeter overflow system, this is what people refer to as your pool gutter. It goes around, it's, it's how the water is collected around the perimeter of the pool. Um, you're required to have a 360 degree perimeter system on a pool this size. Most of the reductants or pollutants that exist in a swimming pool are things that float, not things that sink. So skin cells, oil, hairs, you know, pieces of people's beard, you know, this, the icky stuff tends to float, not sink. So even though there are main drains at the bottom of the pool collecting the water from the bottom, it turns out most of the gnarly stuff is actually kind of hanging around the surface. So when you have gutter choices, and again, for those of you who are at the West Springfield uh, walkthrough that we did, they have what's called a rim flow um, deck level gutter, which is this one all the way here on the left. And that means that the pool water, as you can see here, is equal to the lip of the gutter. So um, these are these are more convenient and from lifeguard perspective, uh, pulling people out of the pool that need to be rescued. If there was, God forbid, ever a, a head, neck or back injury where someone dove in the pool and, and injured their spine, um, they would need to be removed from the pool on a backboard or a spine board. And having that zero inch deck to water level is very convenient for removing victims. It's also very popular with, you know, swim teams and swim lessons because, you know, your stuff is right there in the deck, your water bottle, your, your fins. During swim practice, they have uh, snorkels, fins, kickboards, pull buoys, you, you know, swimmers go to practice with this giant mesh bag filled with thing, equipment they use during the workout, and they could just place it on the deck and it's easy to grab. Um, skimmer is another option. It's, it's, it's not a good option for you guys. Um, I would push you against skimmers. Those are those little openings that periodically appear around the perimeter. Um, we don't like doing that for pools that are larger. We like doing that for like hotels and swim schools and smaller pools. And it makes nasty water during swim practice. I mean, you got 80 kids in the pool swimming, sweating, and the, it doesn't collect stuff off the surface as well. So I would just stay away from that option. Um, and then the other gutter option is fully recessed, which is this style here you see, where now there's a um, big jump between the water level and the deck, um, but you have this giant like sort of cavern uh, It's a it, that goes around the pool perimeter. Um, it's, it's, it's not a bad system. Uh, you just have to be okay with that, you know, maybe eight, 10 or 12 inch deck to water level. So now you really have to kind of rely on the ladders to climb out. And especially for uh, maybe the older community that come in for water uh, aerobics or elderly swim or community swim. Now they really can only enter and exit the pool from the ladder points because it's hard for older people to actually hurl themselves up and out of the pool here. Um, some people say that uh, they like it better because the deck is a little more dry. So if you're a swim coach or a swim official or you're a referee or you're just a spectator at a swim meet, a uh, gym coach or whatever, if you're on the pool deck walking around, all the splashing water tends to just stay in the pool. And also we like doing it in California because there's uh, water polo is more popular in California than basketball is in New England. So every high school in California has two pools and like 17 water polo teams. 
And this is a nice system because the water polo balls don't fly out of the pool when you miss. They just sort of sit against the wall. So those are your options. Plus, when it comes to gutter, um, we do them two ways. We do them um, where we pour them as concrete. So these are all concrete uh, renditions you're seeing here um, where it's a tiled concrete. And you can see we've just poured these gutter forms as part of the deck and it's all concrete everywhere with tile. There are companies that produce prefabricated stainless steel gutters. And for those of you who are familiar with pools or been around pool decks, or maybe have kids on swim teams or swim lessons, sometimes you see these gutters and they're 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 metal. It's a metal rim that goes around. It's a stainless steel finish. Um, that's another option if you don't like tile. Some people don't like tile because tile can crack and and sort of fall off over time. Tile's not a perfect thing. So as people drop stuff and over the years as they're jumping and climbing and jumping and climbing. Um, if somebody has one of those metal water bottles, you know, people have these Nalgene's now that are made of metal. If they drop it and it cracks a tile, cracked tile can be as sharp as glass. Um, so the stainless steel gutter just eliminates all this tile that you see like in front here, or you can see all the one inch tile on this version here and see where it says five foot zero inches, the depth marker. That's all done with one by one tile, one inch tile. Um, stainless steel gutter would just kind of eliminate that. But, but stainless steel is just a little more pricier. That's all. It's, it's not out of the question pricier, but um, when it comes to price point, you're looking at probably the most expensive gutters would be the stainless steel. Um, and just again, it's a little, a couple more images so you could see, um, you know, what, how nice this deck level looks here down the bottom left corner. It's a real sharp looking design. The water kind of, as, as swimmers go in the pool and the water level rises, like when you put too many ice cubes in a glass and the water starts to come up out of the glass, it's going to overflow and just go smoothly into that gutter grating and back down to the filter system. Um, and then of course, here's this um, raised system here, this what we call fully recessed or cantilever style. And you can notice right away that there's a big jump from the water level to the deck. And I don't have any pictures, but you can imagine the same gutters, but instead of tile, a stainless steel, you know, material that goes around. So just again, you're going to have to choose. Um, if it were my pool, I would want a deck level uh, tile gutter just because I like them. But um, your choice. You should probably talk to some swim coaches and maybe some uh, maintenance professionals at the school to see what they prefer. Because some people don't want to deal with the broken tiles over the years. So, so we do have Cora, who's the the swimming coach. So, listening in, and maybe before we jump jump to the next one, do you guys want to give an opinion? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, I mean, I I don't really. It doesn't really matter to me which one. Right now, we coach at both, so we have the fully recessed right now at the high school, um, which is more difficult for, I would say, like, larger kids. Like, if there's people or anyone who's a little bit larger, like, body size to get out. Um, and then at Pine Knoll, the outdoor pool we have is a uh, deck level. So um, that's easier to teach some stuff on with little kids, with younger kids. Um, so I probably would prefer deck level, but, I mean... I asked some of the other swim coaches. I haven't heard anything back yet, but. Okay, that's good for initial. So we'll continue to. Um, so to for now, show. just put deck level down because in case we have deadlines coming up during schematic or early design, in, in case I don't hear back from you right away, I'm just going to put that you have a preference for deck level and we'll have yeah. time during design development and stuff. The only thing is there's a major design difference between the gutters. So just uh, to the architects on the line, we need to make a decision on something like this uh, before we start construction documents or get through heavy DD sets because it changes piping, it changes plumbing, um, surge tank locations change. And with a deck level uh, gutter, we actually have to have the surge tank a little higher than the water line. Um, and then with a, a fully recessed gutter, we can have the, the um, we can have the surge tank flush on the deck. So and there's there's all kinds of velocity and plumbing and piping changes between the two gutters so we had an experience where they changed their mind when we were in like 50 percent cd and we had to charge for designing redesigning the whole pool all over yeah. so, so major I, major thing 
I made a note that we'll need to make sure that this decision is solidified by mid DD at the latest. At, at the latest, yeah. I mean, we really would like to know by the time we're getting through 100% schematic, to be honest. We really do. Okay. Um, Thanks, because it, it makes major design changes. It's not like, oh, change this color from red to blue, please. Sure, we'll switch it. You know, it's like, okay, get a designer on this for three days and do a full redesign. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's okay. That's good to know. And I think that um, I think that the deck level probably is a little bit more restrictive for us just because you have to allow that space around the perimeter of the school. So I think it's a good place to start. And if we end up with the other one. Yeah, just talk it out. out and soon. then also decide, do you want it to be poured with tile or do you want to have the, the stainless steel gutter? And I could pull up some okay. pictures if you want, but instead of blue tile there, it's just a stainless steel. I would prefer um, stainless steel. That's what we have outside. Okay, so yeah, all right. And less maintenance. The only thing about the stainless steels over time, it could get a little rusty and sort of worn looking. So, but they make little brushes and polishes that you just kind of go through every so often and uh, and and polish it off. Plus, t tile tends to get a scum line on it. And then again, like I said, if you start breaking tiles over the years, those things are gnarly. They end up like razor blades. So mm -hmm. I'll just put a uh, stainless steel uh, deck level gutter down as a preference for now, and then we'll revisit it later on. Sounds perfect. Thank you. Cool. Um, pool heaters. Um, okay, so you're going to have to heat the pool. There's no doubt about it. Um, now, I know that this pool wants to maybe avoid doing electric or do, avoid doing gas if possible because you're trying to do a carbon footprint type goal. Um, but at the same time, I know that there is gas access to the site. I've talked to the architects about this a little bit. Um, so it's not that you don't have any gas, you do, you're just trying to reduce using it as much as possible. I would say when it comes to swimming pools, try to make this one of the exceptions where you do use gas because the natural gas heating systems available in the pool um, industry are really good. They're, they're pre-manufactured on skids. They've got it all in a box, shows up, you plug it in, you plumb it in, you, we do a little coordination with MEP and the thing runs, that's it. They're designed for commercial pools. There's one here on the bottom right. Um, Lock and Bar is one of the brands we like to use. And there's another one called Raypack. Those are pretty much the two choices that they'll have to make. Both of them have New England representatives. I think there's a lot more Raypack New England service reps than there are Lock Navar because we did a few Lock Navar projects out in the Northeast and it was really hard to find someone to service them at the end of the day when they went down and needed work. Out in California, and Florida and Texas, they're everywhere. But for whatever reason, the pool contractors and the aquatics reps in New England prefer Raypack. And you've got them in Boston, New Hampshire, Connecticut. There's a guy in Hartford that services Raypack. He's a licensed dealer. So um, if it were me, I would just go with a Raypack uh, natural gas heater. They're way more efficient. But when it comes to electric, it's available, but it's just a high operation capital cost. It's a really slow heat rise. And um, it's better for, you know, smaller spas and pools. Um, there's the heat recovery systems which are available and those capture heat from other building sources through heat exchangers. I'm sure you guys have worked with stuff like that before. Um, and then there's heat pumps, which is trending for the carbon neutral footprint, but need a lot of space and high capital costs. And, the, and to be honest, when it comes to the electric heat recovery and heat pumps, we start to lose scope there and rely more on MEP type figures to coordinate. Whereas if you go with a natural gas pool heater, just it's our scope, we do it um, with, with just sort of normal coordination. Once you get close to that heat recovery, heat pump stuff, it falls off of our plate because that's just a total MEP project at that point. Um, <clears throat> so natural gas, obviously pros boilers can be up to 97% thermal efficient. They're affordable option from capital and operations perspectives. Very easy maintenance, typically requires just like a service company to come annually. I know in Hartford, you've got Streamline Aquatics, and I think out in uh, Bellrica, Massachusetts, you've got South Shore Gunite, and there's, there's a handful of others that will come out and work on Raypax within three to five business days. Um, cons really is just the fossil fuel contributes to climate change and pollution. So if that's, you know, one of your goals and it's not going to work out, but if you guys can make an exception on the pool because you're being conscious otherwhere in the building, then maybe it's it's okay to make an exception. And there's your ray pack down there on the bottom left. Um, 
They're both great, but okay. An electric heat, again, pros, environmentally friendly, great choice for small. Cons, super expensive, three times the cost of natural gas, high operational cost, five times more expensive than natural gas, and it takes forever to, to heat. Um, okay, that's the heat thing. So do you have any comments on pool heaters? Uh, do you want to make a decision now, or do you want to talk more with your facility plant managers and MEP people on that? I, yeah, I, that would be, that's not my choice. We just need a heater that's on that. <laughs> I, I do believe that our, our, you know, our assumption from the architecture side, and Andy, if you want to speak to this as well, is that it would be a gas, a gas system. Um, the pool project is completely separate from the high school project, so it is not needing to meet the same um, level of performance, environmental performance that the high school is. So the high school is going to be all electric, it's going to be very um, low energy use, but the pool is a distinct uh, project entirely. So I think our assumption was always that we would go with natural gas. So if that seems, we can we can bring it up again with a, a larger group, but um, I believe that is our kind of our basis of design. Bill, I would I would just add that that's a that I think that's a good starting point. Uh, we'll kind of see what um, what plays out with the the school system, and if, for example, we end up going with a you know a geothermal option, then there might be some room to think about uh, extending that to the pool. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So I'll leave that in your court to hash out at future meetings, and you'll let me know how that quorum goes. Thanks. Right. Is that a quorum? Is that what they say, right? Quorum. <laughs> um, okay. Pool chemicals. You've got two choices in terms of um, delivery or, or, you know, um, how it gets into the pool. You've got a tablet or sort of an erosion feed style system, uh, dry tablets, dry, dry chemicals, or you have liquid. Um, now with tablet or erosion feeders, um, you get 68% available chlorine in solid tablet form with a two-year shelf life. These come in, you know, Home Depot looking buckets, you know, they come in, you know, plastic buckets with lids on them and you take them off and you dump them in the feeder. Um, you don't have to worry too much about PPE. You might want to wear a dust mask in case they make a cloud of little dust in the air as they pour around, but you're not worrying about hazardous chemicals, actually liquid chemicals spilling on you. For those of you at the uh, West Springfield uh, walkthrough, they were using dry chemicals there. So we went in that little room where those little feeder buckets were. Um, it's pretty convenient. You call your local supplier, they deliver you a van full of these buckets. You put two buckets on a time on a hand truck, you roll them in through a normal door. They weigh maybe, I don't know, 50 pounds or something. You pick them up, you put them down, you stack them on each other, and they could just sit in the pump room for up to two years. You're going to go through them fairly quickly, but, um, you know, I'll, if there's a, we have like pools, 18 year old lifeguards are working there and, oh, the chemicals are here. Go, go grab them, bring them down. Okay. You know, just go pick up two buckets and throw them in the room. Um, solid tablet is safer to store and handle. Um, so you don't spill it on your foot or get it in your eyes or whatever. Um, multifunctional product that contains chemicals needed to balance water and prevent scaling and corrosion. So, um, you know, like Cal Hypo is a combination of chemicals, you know, in the tablet, like uh, calcium and, and chlorine. So kind of helps a little bit with your water balance. Whereas with liquid chlorine, you have to kind of manage like a, a various amounts of chemical balance. Um, requires 50% less acid to buffer pH. So you're using less, you, you use less dry versus wet, you know, volume to volume, you know, when it comes to trying to get to your goal. Um, better looking water quality versus with users reporting a bluer pool. I'm not going to say that that's true or not. That's just what people report. Um, I can't back that up from a scientific evidence perspective. There's never been any studies on that, but people tend to think that they think their pool looks a little more blue and sparkly with the dry stuff. Um, liquid is um, eight to 12% available chlorine liquid that degrades very quickly. So it's kind of feeding quite a bit. 
uh, corrosive liquid requiring special storage and handling requirements. So we'll need to make mechanical rooms that have separate chlorine rooms with little curbs and secondary containment. And normally those liquid chlorine and liquid acid containers are quite large because you have to fit many, many, many gallons in them at a time. Um, 90% water that is difficult to transport. Um, so it's not as easy as delivering buckets where they get dropped off outside the door and you walked in by somebody. We're talking, you know, delivery trucks with 50 foot hoses and they need a line of sight and somebody's got to be there when the delivery happens. And um, it's, it's a little tricky. There are good liquid chlorine delivery companies in your region. So that's not an issue. It's not a supply chain issue. It's just it, it takes a while to fill these tanks and somebody's come in with a hose and a truck and it's a whole to do thing. And you usually have to make an appointment and they come and they meet you and you got to meet them there and et cetera. Um, liquid chlorine, can, liquid chemicals contain metals in them that can stain pool surfaces. So they're just a little more damaging to metal surfaces. Um, you know, maybe the, the, the tiles get a little stain on them sometimes over time, which can be washed off or polished off. But um, like backstroke stanchion flags and stuff like that sometimes don't really like it too much. Um, highly alkaline liquid requiring 50% more acid to buffer the pH. So um, like I said earlier, you just need more liquid than tabs, you know, volume to volume to get the job done. Um, and poor water quality looking, dingy looking water. Again, this slide came from one of the manufacturers who sells the tablets so you can see why it's a little skewed but um they do report that and any of you with pool experience has, have probably been around either liquid chlor liquid chemical pools or tablet pools <laughs> um but we would specify uh you know either one either one we do out in california people prefer liquid so it's it's a different market out there so there's just most pools are using liquid out in california Whereas out here in New England, they prefer erosion or tablet. They both work great. It's really just a matter of how small you want the footprint to be, which your tablet would obviously be a much smaller footprint in your pump room and uh, how easy you want to be able to get these deliveries and move the stuff around. So tablet would probably be a better fit there. Um, it's just some images for you. You've got uh, Pulsar products makes... Um, <clears throat> tablet acid feeders and tablet chlorine feeders. So you can see to the left here is a Pulsar um, feeder for acid. Um, so you would dump tablets into this little jar that has a red lid on it. The tablets are acid plus and they would, uh, water floods this thing when it calls for a feed and it washes the stuff around, turns it into like a liquid, it dissolves and then it goes to the pool until the controller senses that the pH is where, is where it needs to be and then it stops. And then this one on the top right is a pulsar chlorinator. So this again is a big tub, you lift the blue lid, there's a bunch of tablets in there and it just feeds. There are lots of knobs and, and tubing and there's a little booster pump and there's a whole little sort of apparatus that goes around these things that will require just some basic kind of cleaning and scrubbing and brushing from time to time. Um, Nothing too complicated, and normally the suppliers will kind of come by during install and commission them with your janitor or your pool guy and make sure he's comfortable with what he needs to do. But it's not rocket science. These are very easy to manage. Um, and then here's another brand down here. This is produced by PPG. PPG is a very large company. They're very reliable. They make these AccuTabs, um, Cal Hypo, so they kind of have a mix of the calcium and the chlorine. Again. Um, you know, you dump the, the tablets in the top drum and then it rinses them around with some water, turns it into a slurry and then drops it into the pool. Um, we generally specify PPG AccuTabs on all of our projects. We are a AccuTab specifier. Um, but in New England, you've got a lot of Pulsar reps and Pulsar is a reliable company too. And not saying one is better than the other. We just do things a certain way in California. And now here they do things differently. Um, there are the, the, the systems that we saw at West Springfield are, are Pulsar systems. Um, and that's because there is a very uh, reputable and reliable Pulsar dealership in Hartford, Connecticut area or New Haven, one or the other. Um, so you, have, you do have representation nearby. And I think that the local AccuTab Pulsar, or I'm sorry, AccuTab 
PPG supplier is out near Boston. So a little further, but nothing crazy. Um, you've got great representation for both. Both products are reputable. Um, I would just kind of think it over a little bit. Again, this is just like the regen filters. You got a couple great manufacturers to choose from. And if you want to go with our base bid, we'll just spec PPG because we do that on all of our projects. We've got thousands of projects with PPG on them and they work great. Um, and then West Springfield uses a company called Streamline Aquatics. Uh, Streamline Aquatics is a commercial swimming pool service contract company. They're in Hartford and West Springfield has been using them since conception and they are extremely happy with the service they get. And uh, Streamline is the closest Pulsar dealer. So if you went with Pulsar, you'd be buying it and getting it serviced and warrantied by that firm. AccuTab, I don't know who that is. I think it would be a company called uh, Fillion and Associates who I've never worked with, but um, either way. Um, here is an image of <clears throat> what a liquid chlorine or liquid chemical scenario would sort of resemble here. You've got this guy showing up with this truck filled with giant amounts of chemicals. Uh, he's got to run this 50 foot hose you know, usually that's the max, by the way. So architects, just be aware, you, know, you need to have a drive up entry for the pump room with a curb that this guy's going to pull up and he's not going to want it to be more than 50 feet from the, the, the drum where he's got to dump this stuff. They might be able to get a 75 foot hose. I don't know. But also, too, they, they do like to have line of sight when they deliver this stuff because this guy doesn't want to dump a hose into a drum and then walk out and be out here in the parking lot and kind of turn on some pump and start pumping extremely dangerous chemical without seeing if it's overfilling or underfilling. They, they, they have gauges and panels that kind of tell them when it's full or empty, et cetera, but they don't like really trusting those things. A lot of times if someone's around during a delivery, there'll be one guy inside and one guy outside on walkie talkies and it'll be like, all right, tubes in the container, turn it on. And then they load it and okay, it's full stop, you know, but these delivery guys usually drive in, in, singles so this delivery man isn't going to come with another guy it's going to be one dude driving a truck and he's going to want to pull up during business hours when someone's there they got to let him in etc um and here's here's what some of these drums look like the bottom right hand corner is what the acid looks like when it comes in liquid form they come in these like five gallon carboys this stuff is extremely corrosive very dangerous gets on your skin it just boils your hand right off so you got to wear heavy duty gloves um, you know, you gotta have glasses, you know, some people put on PPE like crazy. And then these things get dumped in one at a time into like a drum, like you see above. And sometimes it splashes or spurts or whatever, but, um, <clears throat> it's an option. So, you know, I would talk to some of your pool friends, neighbors, other towns, people that you like, and just find out, you know, what they use and if they like it. Uh, if it were me, I would just go with the dry feed stuff because it's safer and easier. Um, but some people prefer liquid. So it's just totally a choice that you got to make. Um, okay, so any any comments on the liquid versus dry tablet uh, chemical systems? Bueller? They, they use, um, at the outdoor pool for at Pine Knoll, they have Pulsar. So I know they're used to using that at one of the pools here. I don't know what they use here at the high school, but. Uh, West Springfield High School, they're using Pulsar and you're, they're saying, you're saying they use Pulsar where you are. So, um, and again, this decision in my opinion should really have to do with distribution because Pulsar, PPG, you know, these <coughs> companies, they don't sell their stuff directly to people and they don't certainly don't service it or sell any of the chemicals. So it's really dependent upon who the local service company is that's going to take care of you that really matters. And I know that West Springfield has Streamline Aquatics and they're extremely satisfied with the service they're getting and the delivery of chlorine that they get and that sort of thing. So I would, I would make your decision based on the company that's ultimately going to be your, you know, rep that, that, that carries the stuff from the factory because the factory pawns off all their products into geographical areas. So you're either going to have a company in Boston or a company in Hartford. So it's really, that's really, really what it comes down to, in my opinion. So I'll let you guys kind of talk that over for a little while, but um, I mean, any, any decision to be made now, or do you want to discuss it for a later decision? I 
I think that's going to need to wait till okay. we have the pool maintenance people here. Good. <laughs> All right. So I'll put uh, I'll put chemicals TBD. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, next one is chemical controller. Um, <clears throat> so there are two major chemical controller companies in the region that people use um, prominent, which is what they have over at um, West Springfield. This is the one on the left. And then Bex. Um, Bex is here on the right. Um, prominent in New England is distributed by Streamline Aquatics, same company that does the Pulsar. And Bex is distributed by um, Fillion and Associates is again is the same company that's in the Boston area, and I think they have a location in East Providence, Rhode Island, as well. So local, relatively. Both these controllers are both number one and number two in the marketplace. They have probes on them. They um, automatically measure your chemical readings. They automatically trigger the systems to feed when they need to feed. Um, they give you great readings. They both have um, you know, remote monitoring capabilities from your computer, your iPhone, that sort of thing. Um, we personally, on projects where the client says, stop wasting our time with all this stuff, just pick for us. We, we, our base specification is BEX. Um, again, that's because out in California, this is the common one. But then again, out here in the Northeast, you see a lot of prominent I know one of the biggest pool builders in the Northeast, uh, they're called South Shore Gunite. They're probably going to bid this project at some point to build it. They're prominent builders and they put them on all their pools. So, and they've been around for 30 years. So I know that there is a ton of prominent controllers in New England, which means there's a ton of support. And there are plenty of BECs as well. So I would talk to your pool gurus or some of your friends and neighbors of pools and just say, hey, what kind of controller do you have? And do you like it? Um, when it comes to CO2, um, I would I would get, you have two choices. You can go with the torpedoes, which are those little canisters that need to be swapped out. Or this is what we call a big, uh, you know, cryogenic tank. We prefer this style. It's a giant tank that is used for the CO2. CO2 helps uh, sort of balance pH and alkalinity. It's used in, as a secondary system to your acid. We were going to recommend that you get one regardless. Um, I think the choice you just have to make is whether or not you want to have the torpedoes, those little scuba tanks that need to get swapped out, or if you want to have a permanently located tank that's large like this. What's nice about these is um, it's the same CO2 that uh, it's the same CO2 that they use in like restaurant industry for like beer taps and soda guns and stuff like that. So if you're getting CO2 deliveries to the cafeteria anyway, um, it's the same company. Um, and what's nice about this is we can run a fill tap or a fill faucet fixture outside the building and it's connected to this. So when um, Mr. Soda Man is running through East Longmeadow, going to all the restaurants and bars and friendlies and wherever they're going, you know, Buffalo Wild Wings, if it's on the route, they're just going to stop by the school. They're not even going to tell you they're coming. They'll park outside. They'll hook up to the uh, little connector out by the street. They'll fill it, and then they'll move on to their route. Um, it makes for really easy deliveries. You don't have to wheel in the scuba tanks, wheel them out. And um, you get this little feed unit, which is pretty nifty. It'll, it'll kind of sense when you need CO2, and it just sort of adds it into the injectors and delivers it to your pool. Um, I would go with this system if I were you guys, just get the cryogenic tank, big, big fat one like this. Um, sounds like this is probably something you want to talk to some more pool people about, right? Yeah. Chemical controller is probably the most, second most important decision you're going to make. Uh, the filter system is the big one. And then second most important decision is this. You got to pick prominent backs or there's other controllers. We just think these two are the top two. Um, the user interface, I mean, the chemical controller is something that your staff are going to be touching and looking at and using multiple times a day. Um, calibrating it, cleaning it, checking it, you know, they've got little flow cells so you can take water samples off of it, do your pool tests from it. 
it's the brains of the operation. It's like saying you're going to go to work and not touch your laptop for the whole day. It's probably impossible. Um, this is your laptop. This is the this is rules what runs the pool. So make a very informed decision when it comes to prominent or backs. Talk to all your friends and neighbors and find out well, which one you prefer. Um, we support either one. Just a couple little points on prominent. Um, does pH and ORP or PPM control? That's sort of a CPO guy type question, but you could flip back and forth from either ORP or PPM, which is convenient. Um, <clears throat> chemical savings, it's got a true loop feed. So it, it, it may reduce your chemical costs very marginally. Um, stays connected, which is important. You got data logging and you can get graphing and email, text alarms if things are out of range. You know, say it's a Sunday holiday and you're at home and something's wrong with the pool. You might get an email from your controller. Hey, uh, come check on me. Something's wrong. You know, so that's pretty nice. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. No special apps are needed. Um, this company is always renovating, always innovating, always coming out with high-tech stuff. They're they're very good. Um, and then, of course, you got your back systems. They have a million different features. Um, could be a little overkill if you don't have a top CPO type figure. These are really good for, you know, complicated systems and pools and water parks or multiple bodies of water. And if you've got a CPO with a lot of training, um, that's very, you know, sharp pool guy, um, you know, because of all the options here. Um, what we like about these is they can kind of integrate with other parts of the system. But again, if you're just looking for simplicity, I would think that maybe the prominent system is probably a better choice. Plus, you've got Streamline down the road. And how far are you guys from West Springfield? Oh, I don't know, about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so Streamline Aquatics is going to be making regular visits to West Springfield to manage this equipment. So if you've got it, they'll probably just be coming to visit you as often as they're visiting West Springfield and as far as you might want to call your West Springfield pool guy and just say, hey, what's the what's the deal with Streamline? Do you like them or not? And um, if he gives you a good report and says they take good care of us, then I would just do what they do. Um, VFD, this one is really just do you want it or do you not want it? Um, we'll handle the equipment selection. <laughs> it, could, it could get very complicated. We use, you know, Pentair VFDs and we, we, there's no sense trying to figure out which one you want. It's really just, do you want it or do you not want it? Um, variable frequency drives are super effective at managing the pump's uh, energy usage. Um, it ramps up the pump when the pool feels dirty. It ramps down the pump when the pool's not dirty. You know, at two, three, four, five in the morning when there's no one swimming in the pool, this device can sense that and sort of ramp down all your systems so it saves a lot of energy i know that it will increase the life of a pump and motor because instead of running your pump full blast all day every day 24 7 this thing will kind of ramp it up and down based on you know the time you know how it senses the water usage is being used and that's done by the you know filtration and flow rate and pressure differentials in the filter so this thing will know if the pool is being heavily used at the time or if it's not, and it will speed up the pump, which obviously uses more energy, or will say at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2 in the morning, slow down the pump because no one's there. And it could save a lot of money. Um, they say it saves up to 80%, and we have seen research studies that show that that's just about accurate. Um, these things tend to pay for themselves in three to five years. Uh, in costs because of all the energy savings. And I also believe that the uh, electric companies in, in the country, like National Grid and some of these big electric companies, they will actually um, reimburse you some of the cost for using this. So there is some incentives out there, grants sort of thing. I think it's like $50 per horsepower or something like that. So if we end up with like a 20 horsepower pump, um, you know, you're looking at a significant, you know, return that they can spot you. Um, I would totally recommend getting a VFD on your pool. Um, it West did West Springfield have one of these? I feel like he talked about that when we were there. 
Yes, yes. And and all the pools these days are getting them standard. Some people cut them out at like when they um, are way over budget or some seasonal pools that are like outdoor in the summer pools. They're like, yeah, we're only open three months, whatever. We don't need it. Um, and then a lot of the pools that were built like 10 years ago and older don't have them because they were like 30 grand when they first came out. But now they've got the price down on these pretty good. So, I mean, it's a fraction of that cost these days. You're talking maybe five, 10 grand for one of these. Um, I think or, the assumption is that we would have this. Yeah, I would. Just as a, a basis. I, I think we should just assume that. And like you say, if for some reason we had to nix it later on, we we could, but I don't yeah. think that would be advisable. Then you would just have to have a pump starter. Um, you know, you'd have to manually turn on, turn off the pump, that sort of thing. This, the VFD yeah. is a smart control. It's, it's, and again, just to remind everyone on the call, I'm not a salesman and I don't sell products and I don't make commission and I don't rep these products. I'm just your designer. So I, I'm, I, there's no benefit for me to convince you to or against them. If I didn't think it was worth it, I would just tell you not to, but um, especially for a project where the environment is a big part of the goals here. This is sort of definitely a lead points kind of thing. And it, it, it's, it's really good environmental PR for the pool. It saves a lot of energy. Um, so I'm just gonna put yes down for VFD unless anyone has any objections. I think that's safe to say for right now, Mike. I know there's uh, several people who aren't on the call or on the meeting today um, that we'll touch base with to make sure they're informed. Sure. But I think that's- In my a, opinion, this is a no brainer. Um, the only reason you wouldn't is if you're like, like lethally over budget and had to V the project down to nothing. But if that's not the case, this, is, this should be as essential as any other piece of equipment. Okay, um, ultraviolet technology. Um, this is similar to VFD because it was not a common technology 10 years ago and a lot of pools didn't get them back then. Um, they are very easy to add as a aftermarket item. So you could build the pool without it and then add it later. Um, but it's a growing health code requirement in many states. It's part of the CDC's model aquatic health code. Um, it reduces uh, chloramines in the room so that you do not get that chlorine air smell and that stinging eye feeling. Um, USA Swimming uh, endorses them on all their pools. Uh, YMCA of the United States uses them on all their pools. If this is truly going to be a swimming pool, indoor swimming pool that has swim team and competitive swimming, I would definitely get the UV. Um, if any of you have ever been in an old indoor pool without it, you can easily tell because the pool room smells like chlorine when you're in the uh, auditorium, your eyes are stinging. Um, competitive swimmers that are practicing in swim pools without UV tend to get athletic asthma. That's when you get the kids coughing um, a lot and the coaches are there. They leave the deck and they're rubbing their eyes for like two hours after practice because their eyes are stinging. Um, what happens when chlorine uh, combines itself with dirt in the pool, there's a gas, uh, there's a gas byproduct. So if there's a, a piece of dirt or sweat or urine or something and the chlorine finds it and starts to attack it, which is what chlorine does, it will oxidize that item, but there's a little gas that comes out of the, into the air as a result. But when you multiply that by the millions and millions of chlorine molecules and millions and millions of dirt molecules, you get a lot of gas and the chloramines tend to um, sit right on the water surface because the chloramine gas is a lot more dense than regular air. So you get like a vapor that sits on the pool deck and right on top of the water during swim practice or swim meet warmups. Um, I, I would do this. Plus, plus it, it, it destroys recreational water illnesses. So another reason people get UV is because um, things like cryptosporidium, which is usually found in sick people's feces, uh, E. coli, um, giardia, some of those like weird uh, illnesses that kind of float around in the pool. Um, also, uh, cryptosporidium, which is the most common recreational water illness in, in the pool industry, is chlorine tolerant. So chlorine doesn't even get crypto out. It would have to be filtered by a regen filter and then um, manipulated by the UV. So if you have an ultraviolet regen filter combination, you've already decided on the regen. If you have a UV regen combination, 
you pretty much can 100% rely on no one getting sick in your pool ever. Um, when there's a crypto outbreak in a swimming pool, it doesn't affect one person. It affects everyone that went in the water that day. So if there is a crypto outbreak, you get in both swim teams and anyone that touched the water sick. Um, there's been a lot of lawsuits and nastiness around the country over the years, um, which is why UV sort of found itself in the pool industry. Uh, medium pressure UV has been used in the water treatment industry for, for a long time. They use it in sewage treatment plants and drinking water plants, et cetera. Uh, it found its way into the commercial swimming pool market maybe 20 years ago. And since then, every single indoor pool we design has UV on it, period. And that goes for just about every single project in the country by any consultant for that matter. Um, and you get choices again, you've got ETS, UV, which has a ton of distributorship in the Massachusetts area. There's probably 30 times more ETS installs than prominent, but prominent is also out there. West Springfield has prominent. And the reason they probably have that is because they got it from Streamline and Streamline's their uh, supplier down in Hartford. So it maybe makes sense to just stick with the prominent line. <coughs> have the same one guy operating it. But um, ETS is the one that we typically specify. We don't specify prominent on our projects just because we've had a long working relationship with ETS. But that doesn't mean that we wouldn't specify prominent. We would. Um, they're both great. Um, I would just, again, think this one over as far as which brand you want and whether you want it or not. But I would, I would totally recommend UV on an indoor pool where competitive swimming is a big part of your programming. Any comments on UV? I mean, I again, oh, go I ahead. think it's kind of a no brainer, if especially not even just because of the swim teams, but I think with hopefully more community use with older people and then a lot more swimming lessons coming in the pool, the cleanliness is going to be really huge because you don't want a huge outbreak of anything stemming from the pool. <laughs> So. Yeah, and the chloramine gas gets people sick too. You know, I mean, it really does. The chloramine gas gets you get a you get a swim meet warm up going in there. You know, you've got two teams warming up. You know, you're putting probably sixty to eighty kids in the pool in a matter of three or four hours. And if you have a USA swim meet on the weekend with Friday night sessions, Saturday sessions, and double Sunday sessions with all you know eight and unders all the way to fifteen to eighteen age groups, you're putting you're putting five hundred kids in the pool in three days. So um, UV is just a guaranteed way to make sure that the air environment is nice, especially for the spectators. Like mom and dad don't want to be on the pool deck during a swim meet if you don't have UV. They're going to be like waiting outside until it's time for their kids race. They'll come in, they'll watch their kids race, and they're going to run outside. And if you go see pools, the older pools without UV, you know they're, they're older pools without UV because all the windows and the doors are cracked open. And they got these giant fans on the ground, and the coaches are just dying to breathe. So it's really an air quality thing for me. The crypto stuff we can address with the filter. Your filter is so, your regen filter is so good that it will actually filter the this, this crypto spiridium out from a filter perspective. That's how good your filter choice has been. So for me, the UV is more about the air quality, but if any crypto gets through, then you've got a secondary backup. That's why they call it secondary disinfection. But for me, the big value for an indoor pool UV is that it'll be like out, outdoor air quality. You'll feel like you're walking around your living room. You're not gonna be coughing or getting your eyes stung or anything like that. So I'll just put yes for the UV and then you guys need to decide if you wanna go with prominent because of streamline nearby or I'm gonna just spec ETS because that's what we normally spec. So it's, I'll give you a chance to choose. If you don't choose, I'm probably just gonna pick ETS. Otherwise, uh, you know, maybe give Streamline Aquatics a call and just tell them that, you know, you're, you have this job going on and you want to maybe meet those guys and get a lunch and learn from them. Um, again, these are all products sold through distribution channels. So they're only going to be as good and reliable and work as well as the service company that services them in the East Long Meadow territory. Because ETS is out in, I don't even know where they're located anymore. They used to be in Wisconsin. But now I think they're in Pittsburgh or Schaumburg or they're out in the Midwest somewhere. Um, and Prominent is a German company, um, but they have Prominent USA, which is in Pittsburgh, and that's where they manufacture all their stuff. So both companies rely on local pool contractors to do their service. These UV systems have 
uh, lamps inside them, very expensive UV lamps that need to be replaced every 12 to 18 months. They have uh, very, very high tech, delicate quartz sleeves on the inside that need to be cleaned um, routinely, maybe once or twice a year. Um, and that has to be done by a licensed, certified, prominent or ETS distributor. This, this is not the type of maintenance anyone from East Long Meadow Public Works or maintenance staff can do. This is the something that, okay, we need our lamps changed, we need our court sleeves changed, and there's some gaskets we need replaced. You have to go with a licensed factory maintenance technician to do that. So I know for prominent, you've got Streamline Hartford and ETS. I couldn't tell you who the local one is. I want to say it's either Weston and Sampson out of Peabody, Mass, or Garino's Swimming Pools, which is near New Hampshire somewhere. So um, that's a big part of this decision. Um, Let's see. And I think that's it for me. I mean, those are that's just the, the meat and potatoes. I'm not going to bore you all with um, I'm not going to bore you all with like, OK, which valves do you want? Which flow meter do you want? Which, you know, I'm not going to go into like the little stuff. I picked like the seven to ten most expensive um, and most critical pieces of equipment in the pump room. I'm not going to go and say what kind of pipe and valves and gaskets and widgets and gidgets. I mean, there's obviously a lot more in a pump room besides filters, pumps, valves, and or VFDs and UVs. You know, we're going to have all kinds of check valves and flow meters and all kinds of gauges, but we're just going to go with standard stuff on that. If that's okay with you, allow me to just use my base bid spec on the 60% of the other apparatuses that I didn't even mention. Um, cause this was sort of high level, but you know, filters are a hundred thousand UVs, like 50,000 controllers are 7,000 VFDs are 10,000. So I wanted to just address things that were super expensive and super crucial to the operation. And then just leave the rest up to us. We'll design the rest. Unless you want me to go through all the little nuts and bolts, but I, please, you don't want me to do that. Any any questions, comments? Is there anything? Was was that informative? I know for people who aren't pool people, you probably think that was the most boring presentation <laughs> you've ever heard in your life. But um, I mean, if you're a pool guy, you like you get it, you know. And I usually work with pool contractors for a living, so uh, it's not often I present to pool committees because they don't normally go in pump rooms. But. Um, I think you made some good decisions based on what I have. I got see so regen filters. I made a note about Aquify just because they can be put in corners. The defender filters need big walking space around them. It's just going to make for bigger footprint. Um, but you can reach out to those people. I uh, prefer a deck level gutter with stainless steel uh, finish on it. Um, gas. We're going to go with a gas heater. Ray pack just because you got local. Chemicals, we're going to talk about that with somebody, but you're leaning towards dry chemical delivery, but find out from someone else if what you want to do there. VFD, yes. Ultraviolet, yes. Are we all on the same that page? That matches my notes. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think that's enough to get us started, you know, with what we need to do, but there's some follow-up on your end. And as long as you don't have super preferences on manufacturers, you know, I would just let me pick them. Otherwise, reach out to Streamline Aquatics. Just go on their website, streamlineaquatics.com. Uh, I think the, the president of the company's name is Chris Peck. He usually picks up his phone on the first ring. Um, and he's got technicians and salespeople driving through that part of Massachusetts weekly doing work at other places. I think they serve like 100 accounts in New England. So they're pretty solid when it comes to servicing the equipment that you choose. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's great. And I think that, of course, we don't have the full group today, so we're not making any official decisions, but we have the kind of the foundations talked through so we can then bring everything to the full pool building committee to get those final decisions made at a later point. Yeah, I guess, and again, we're just input. in like early schematic anyway. So like, this is so preliminary that like, we still will hopefully still have a big fat design development phase in between schematic and construction documents where we can make little tweaks if we need to. Yeah, but it um, gives us enough that we can start sizing mechanical rooms correctly and things like that. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, because yeah, we're going to and, and we still have to talk about pool depths and stuff. That wasn't part of today's agenda, but somebody emailed me and I think it was. Um, Av, Av, Avia, Av, how do you say your name? Aviva. Aviva. Yeah, I think it was Aviva that emailed me about um, what is the max bather load of the pool because you guys have to size your fixture counts. So in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. they're going to determine how many toilets, sinks, showers, urinals that you have to have based on what the max bather load of the pool is. Um, but in Massachusetts, the max bather load of a pool isn't determined by the whole square footage of the pool. It's determined based on how much square footage is five feet or less and how much square footage of the pool is deeper than five feet. So we'll save that for another meeting perhaps, but you need to kind of tell me how deep you want the pool and how quickly you want it to go down. And they have slope requirements. So you're not allowed to just make a pool go from like five feet to like 10 feet. There has to be a one foot for every 10 or 12 foot unit requirement because slopes have to kind of gradually go down. We can't have pools just go like this until we get to overhead water. Then once we hit like six feet, we can sort of drag that slope down a little faster. But looking at what we have so far, there's nothing on their notes that, that talk about pool depths. So yeah, that sounds like a topic for for a, the larger group at a at a later point. Yeah, but I yeah, feel I like mean, we've I, we've done pretty well for today. I don't want to. <laughs> I, I made an assumption for you, Aviva. You know, I gave you a number because I assume that the the five foot depth is going to be somewhere in the middle of the pool. I just don't want to hold back any fixture count type developments because yeah, we were just trying know. to get a preliminary count to make sure two twenty should like be footprint. saved. I mean, we know we don't. I mean, swim coach, we know we don't want like a three foot shallow end because your kids can't do flip turns in like three feet. We know that. And we know we're going to have like a 12 foot deep end because there's a diving board and starting blocks. We need a minimum of six and a half feet deep. But if there's a one meter board, we need way deeper than that. So I made a pretty good assumption. I put thought. All I want you to know is I put a little thought into it. I didn't just throw a number at you. So I think that 220 bather load I gave you is good enough for you to get started on your bathrooms. But until we have real pool depths, I can't tell you that that number is true, true, true. That's fine. That was okay. enough to get started. Thank you. Disclaimer. I just thought of that because the email was yesterday and I gave you a number. So don't be like, hey, he said it's 220. I, I, I assume it's 220. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Is there anything else from anyone on the committee that you want to discuss? Or if not, we'll turn it back over to you to wrap things up. I just have one question on the PDF you showed of the pool. It does not show the diving board. And Mike said between lanes three and four, but we would prefer them to be able to lean lanes two and three. Okay. So that when you're using the pool for diving, you can still use the other half of the pool for swimming. But if it's located smack in the middle of the pool, that makes it hard to use the pool for swimming as well. Well, then you just end up with two, you can use lane one and two, and you can use lane five and six. But we can I, put it I, off to the side if that works better. The outside lanes, which just makes it a little more tricky. So yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so I'll just make a note that you want your one meter diving board in between lane two and three. Yeah. And just keep in mind, it doesn't change the fact that we now want a little bit of wider lanes, though. No, no, I get it. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to have a 45 foot wide pool. We're going to push that a little little yep. further. We've we got can. 48 right now in the plan, Mike. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad. That's better than 45. It just gives us that little extra room there. I mean, if we could get a little more, it'd be great. But 48 is plenty. 45 is not. Cool. I'm just taking all my notes here, just making sure we're good to go. Great. All right. Well, I'm good if you're good, and um, I'm always available, so feel free to reach out anytime. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. All right. Is that it? Yes, I so, believe so. so I don't think we had anything else on the agenda. So I think we can wrap up here. And um, I know we probably aren't going to be able to uh, determine our next meeting date. I think we'll probably wait until after the school building committee meeting on Thursday to figure out when they're meeting next uh, to try to line up our next meeting, Cora. Okay. Um, so I think <laughs> we're good to end it. And motions to adjourn. I don't know even know what to do. We don't have enough people. I don't know. <laughs> can, I bang, can I bang the mallet for the motion to adjourn? <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Right, have a thank great you. Day. Thanks. Bye bye. See you.